In earlier videos, we saw how to describe the state of a qubit and how to manipulate that state using some simple quantum logic gates, namely the knot and the Hadamard gate. There's an interesting question, however, which is to imagine that somebody came up to you and gave you a qubit. It might be, for example, uh, an atom or something like that. It doesn't really matter what the instantiation uh, is, which was in an unknown quantum state, alpha naught plus beta one, or unknown to you. So you don't know what alpha uh, and beta are. You've been presented with this qubit in your uh, laboratory. And then you're asked the question whether or not you can determine, can you determine in particular, uh, the value of alpha and beta. And the answer to this question, it turns out, uh, is in fact no. There is no way, it is fundamentally impossible uh, to observe the quantum uh, state in, or to put it in another way, the quantum state of any system, it doesn't matter, it could be a qubit, uh, you name it, is not directly observable. There's no way we can extract uh, the alpha and the beta. And this is a fundamental constraint uh, on quantum uh, mechanics, on quantum information. Uh, it turns out that the, the absolute best we can do uh, is to get partial information about alpha and beta. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about how we can do that um, very shortly. So that there's you know, a fundamental question to ask, which is what information about alpha and beta uh, can we uh, extract? All right, let me tell you about a process which can be used to extract uh, some partial information uh, from a qubit. It's a process which is called uh, measurement in the computational uh, basis. This is a fundamental uh, primitive in uh, quantum uh, computing. It's, it's the way we actually extract uh, information from our quantum uh, computers. I'm going to describe it for the special case of a uh, whoop, yeah, the special case of a qubit right now, later generalized to multi-qubit systems. So basically you imagine that you've been given a qubit uh, in the state alpha 0 plus beta 1 and you perform this process of measurement in the computational uh, basis and what it does is it gives you a classical bit uh, it tells you whether or not you are in the zero state or the one state. So in particular, it gives you a classical bit zero with probability uh, alpha squared, the norm, that is the uh, absolute value of alpha squared. And it gives you the outcome one uh, with uh, uh, probability beta squared. Again, the, actually the absolute value. And the way you should imagine this uh, process taking place, you know, in reality, your qubit is instantiated in some real physical system. I'll just imagine it's an atom for the sake of concreteness, but it doesn't matter what. And so you've got this uh, qubit in your laboratory, and what you do is you have some uh, measurement apparatus, typically you know, it might be very large and complicated and involve you know, lasers and uh, maybe a microprocessor and perhaps some kind of screen uh, for a readout of the measurement result. And it interacts in some way with your tiny little qubit, your atom, uh, through a measurement process. So it's observing the qubit and it gives you an outcome and it might be that you get the outcome zero, or uh, maybe, maybe instead you get the outcome uh, one, uh, just depending on, on which outcome uh, you get for the uh, measurement in the computational uh, basis. And yeah, so this is sort of the, the the background picture you should have. The crucial fact, in in many ways, is that the outcome is a classical. Uh, piece of information which you can then use uh, to do other things, to control other processes. So in the case of a quantum computation, we're going to have our quantum state, we're going to manipulate it using uh, 
uh, quantum gates, and then at the end of the computation, typically, uh, we'll do this kind of measurement to read out the result of the computation. So a fundamental fact about the, this measurement process, measurement in the computational basis, is that uh, it disturbs uh, the state of the quantum uh, system. It doesn't just leave it uh, uh, alone, it, it does something uh, to it. In particular, after the measurement, after you've done the measurement, if you get the outcome zero, uh, it takes uh, the, the, the state of the qubit afterwards is the zero computational basis state, and if you get the outcome one, uh, the posterior state of the qubit is one. So what's going on here, you know, just to sort of sum it all up, you start with this quantum state, uh, you do this measurement process interaction with a big uh, apparatus, you get a classical bit of information, zero or one, with these respective probabilities, and the final state of your qubit is either the computational basis state zero or the computational basis state uh, one. And kind of the you know, key point to, to note here is that alpha and beta are now gone. You've lost, you know, in the posterior state, there is no trace of the original alpha and beta. So you can't imagine, you know, there's, there's nothing more you can do. There's no more information you can extract about uh, the alpha and the beta there, in some sense, hidden information. You can't get full information about them. And that, that's really important. One reason why it's very important is it means that you can't store an infinite amount of classical information in a qubit. You think about it. Alpha, for example, or beta, but alpha is a complex uh, number. And you might imagine, looking at, say, just the real component of that complex number, uh, storing an infinite amount of classical information in uh, the binary expansion for the real part of that number. And if you could read out alpha exactly in quantum mechanics, uh, then it would be possible to extract all of that information. You could use a qubit to store an infinite amount of classical information. But that turns out uh, to be uh, impossible. Okay, uh, one final point. This is measurement in the computational basis. Uh, it turns out that there are other types of measurement that you can do uh, in quantum mechanics and in quantum computing. But we'll see later uh, that even though it's possible to measure in other ways, the computational basis measurement is in some sense fundamental because by combining measurements in the computational basis plus quantum gates like the uh, Hadamard gate and the uh, NOT gate, we can effectively simulate an arbitrary uh, uh, quantum measurement. So in some sense this is really all you need to know about measurement from an in-principle point of view. In, in, in practice it, it's helpful to know a little bit more. Okay, let's just look at a very simple uh, example of a measurement. It's a qubit in the state 0 plus 1 over root 2, this basic superposition state that we've met several times before. And of course, if you do a measurement in the computational basis state, you get the outcome 0 uh, with probability given by the square of the amplitude. Well, the amplitude is 1 over root 2, so the square of that is 1 half, and you get the outcome 1 with probability. Also the square of the amplitude, 1 over root 2 squared is 1 half, uh, and the posterior states are of course the 0 computational basis state and the 1 computational basis state. Okay, very simple example. Uh, just a little bit more notation uh, for the quantum measurement process. We imagine, let's say we have a state psi coming into a quantum circuit, maybe we have a couple of gates, the x gate, the Hadamard gate, and then we imagine doing a measurement and we'll introduce some notation for that. And this is the notation we'll use to denote a measurement. In some sense it, it you know, sort of, uh, we will also use uh, the term, uh, let's, it can be convenient to introduce some notation, uh, let's call it M uh, to denote the classical outcome. So M is a classical bit and maybe we uh, uh, use this uh, kind of double wire notation to indicate the uh, classical bit M going off and being used to do something else. Maybe it's fed into some classical post-processing or something like that. Uh, in this notation, typically 
uh, even though the qubit is still there and it's you now been updated to the zero state or the one state, um, we won't necessarily draw a wire uh, coming out. Uh, the most common case in quantum computation is that the qubit, once it's been measured, is typically discarded. Uh, that's not always the case, uh, but it's quite commonly the case, and it's assumed by this notation. Okay, so that's the basic notation used in the quantum circuit language uh, for measurement. One final point uh, related to measurement, and that's about the normalization condition on the quantum state that we've talked about uh, frequently. Uh, in particular, if we have our quantum state, and we do a measurement in the computational basis, well, the probability of the different measurement results, 0 and 1, must, of course, add up to 1. And that means that alpha squared plus beta squared is equal to 1. And that's just the normalization condition that we've talked about so often uh, for quantum states. Uh, it's the idea that the quantum state should have length 1 or, or be normalized. Uh, and it's really fundamentally uh, from the fact that the measurement probabilities add up to one that this normalization constraint uh, arises. And that's a good thing to keep in mind. Okay, that's enough about quantum measurement. Uh, in the next video, we're going to come back uh, to single qubit gates, but not just the example gates, the Hadamard and the knot. We're going to talk about general single qubit gates now uh, and what they are and, and how they should be described.